Amen. Please be seated. As we turn to our our time in God's Word this morning, we're in the book of Joel, and um, we're in Joel 1, 8 through 14. My my notes still have last week's passage, so I had to look up. Oh yeah, that's right. We're in Joel. We're in the book of Joel, and we're calling this series Gloom and Glory, which just sounds incredible. Uh, and it kind of is incredible. Um, so we've been looking at last week a disaster, and this week we're looking at the response. Um, but I just want to start with a series of questions that uh, I plan to remember to end with as well, but just to kind of set the tone for, for what we're going to be looking at this morning. What do you do when disaster strikes? Do you ignore it, or do you face it? We, uh, people call it, there's a fight-or-flight response, right? You, do you run away from it, or do you, you stand there and, act, and go after it? What does it look like when you're brought to your breaking point? When you realize, there's, I, I can't do this, I can't handle this, I can't fix this. Where do you go for solutions? Last week, uh, I introduced a quote that I'm probably going to keep using throughout the series because it's just such a great summary of the book and a good reminder that instead of writing my own, I'll just keep using this one. It's a mashup of two people's quotes that a third person put together, and, and now I'm using it. Joel is a prophet between calamity and hope who takes his readers from the depths of despair to the promise of presence. That's, that's our journey through this book uh, this morning and, and in the weeks to come. Is we, 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 we're kind of in this in-between, and, and we're going to look at what the depths of despair are like, but we also have this promise of God's presence that really holds us together all the way through. So last week, we looked at the disaster, and we talked about specific and general elements of it, that it was kind of specific, but also had a lot of generalizations that made it applicable to all sorts of situations and times and places. And we saw that it was just overwhelming. And we talked about the fact that it was shared by the community and also by God. Well, this week, we're going to dip our toes into the response. And so I called this this week the response, uh, but really, it'll continue on, and we'll look at different elements of that response in weeks to come. But this is the beginning of the response. So they had the, the big, overwhelming disaster that they all shared. So what do they do? How do they respond? How do we respond? Um, and really, uh, I, I was talking to, to Lauren, our children's ministry director, uh, this week about this, and she's been doing some other things alongside Joel. She's, um, not focusing as much on all the details as we go through it, but as she takes bits and pieces of this and shares it with our kids, I wanted her to have a, a good summary. And I said, really what we're doing this morning is talking about bringing our big feelings to God, which is a nice, easy way to make that accessible to kids, but sometimes that's a nice, easy way to make it accessible to adults, too. We need to bring our big feelings to God. We're going to start by reading the passage. So Joel chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. Mourn. Like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the betrothed of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, 
the new wine is dried up, the olive oil fails. Despair, you farmers. Wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. Put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. This is God's word. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this reminder that we're not the only ones who face disaster and that your people have had to face figure out how to deal with it for centuries. Lord, I thank you for the instruction that we receive from Joel. Lord, I pray that you would use it to open our minds. Lord, so many of us are so focused on how we would prefer to respond. Lord, I pray that you would help us to loosen our grip on our own ways of doing things and our own sense of control. Lord, that we would give over to you what properly belongs to you. Lord, I pray that as we spend this time considering what you have set before us, that you would use it to work in our hearts as well, that you would stir up in us a desire to bring before you all that is on our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would use me as well, that as I speak the things that you've given to me to speak, that you would help me to do so with clarity. And in a way that helps us all connect to what you would have us to hear this morning. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a little different than how I would normally approach a passage like this. We're not going to walk through, you know, the first two verses and then go to the next three verses. Um, I'm going to look at kind of a progression that I see that because of the poetic nature of how it's expressed, I'm, I'm seeing a timeline that's hap- unraveling, kind of interwoven throughout the passage. Uh, and I'll call out the verses as we get to them, but um, it's just not going to feel as, as chronological as in terms of verse numbers as it typically does. But I think as we go, you'll see that that's just kind of how it's fit together. We're going to start with the idea of acknowledging loss. So we last week looked at the problem. It was described for us in, in pretty good detail. But throughout the call to respond and the descriptions of how to respond, Joel has built in repeated descriptions of the reason for the response, of, of the loss. So that's, really, that's where we're going to start this morning. In verse 10, he describes the problem again. The, the fields are ruined. The ground is dried up. The grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up. The olive oil fails. The end of verse 11, he says, Grieve for the wheat and the barley because... The harvest of the field is destroyed. And then into verse 12, he describes it some more. The vine is dried up, the 
fig tree is withered, the pomegranate and palm, the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. Um, so those focus on the lack of harvest. It's a big deal. They don't have anything. The, there's somebody who's done a study of when each of these crops would have been harvested in that region and, dis, and determined that this really describes the full year. That all the things that they... they it's not just, oh, the fall harvest hasn't come in. Neither has the spring harvest. Neither has the things that you would see in summer. The, the summer fruits are not here. That, that it's, a, it's a everything. It's an all-encompassing problem. So that's a big deal. But then verses 9 and the end of 12 and the end of 13 focus on a, another aspect of the problem. So in verse 9, we see grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. In verse 12, the end, it says, well, I said, surely the people's joy is withered away. And I'll unpack that in a second. The end of 13 says, again, for the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. These are things that were brought daily to just maintain relationship between God and his people. These were not about, these are not sin offerings, so we're not talking about the the animals that get offered up on behalf of sin as a sacrifice. These are just the routine praises to God, thanksgiving to God, all the things that God's people were to do constantly just to maintain that relationship. And so in addition to we don't have food to eat, we also don't have anything to bring to God to maintain that relationship that we have with him that we would expect would lead to the provision of the food that we need. So we, we, we have a problem and it seems like from the way we see it, the solution has been cut off as well. Joel doesn't hide the problem. He doesn't dismiss the problem. He he doesn't try to ignore the problem. Well, you know, maybe, yeah, you don't have food right now, but if if you just hunker down and keep up the good work, surely you'll have some good food soon. No, he, he acknowledges this is, this is desperation for the whole community. And so he, begins, he acknowledges all the way through the loss and the meaning behind the loss, that it, that it has to do with life and the ability to live, and it also has to do with community, communion, fellowship with God that's been cut off. That's where we start. I'm going to kind of wrap these things up as we go, so I'm just going to move on from that one for now, but we'll, it'll keep coming up as, as we move through our morning. The next thing is demonstrating grief. Verses 8, 11, and 13 all use grieving mourning, and synonyms for it, like wearing sackcloth, to either call the people to respond in that way or to describe the response that's already being observed. So let's look at those verses. Verse 8, mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the betrothed of her youth. This is another poetic demonstration of the extreme nature of the situation. He's comparing it to someone who was preparing to get married and then her fiancé dies before they even get to have the wedding. So she trades in her wedding dress for the clothes of mourning. And in that society, that's not just a momentary or a one month or a three month. Well, she's going to grieve for a while. She'll be sad. But then she's still young. 
She'll find somebody else. It doesn't quite work that way. Often the, those, those arrangements were planned when kids were born, sometimes even before then, who they would marry. She may not have another opportunity. And as a result, she may not have the financial security that a wife would. She certainly won't have the honor and the glory that would be associated with being the matriarch of her family. Her life has been dramatically changed. That's, that's an analogy. It's an, a picture of God's people in this situation. That, that what should have been a time of joy and gladness of life it's a time of mourning and grief and death. Why? Well, let's look at, at 11. Despair, you farmers. Wail, you vine growers. Some, um, I don't know how much I want to get into this. We're going to talk more about Hebrew today than I'd like um, because there's just a lot of, of messiness here. But the despair could also be a, a word. We don't know the way that Hebrew works. It's, you've got roots that are based on consonants. And so if the vowels change, that changes the root. But the consonants are the same. And so sometimes, occasionally, like this situation, we look and say, well, it must be this root word that means despair or mourn. And other times, the, 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 other, the, con the three consonants that are in common could also mean uh, be ashamed. And we would say, well, it's not the farmer's fault. Why should they be ashamed? But some of your translations are going to show that in English, that it's uh, be ashamed. And so I, I don't want to ignore that that's there. The reason you would, you would expect it to say be ashamed is really because they're looking at all the work that they did and, and the lack of results. And I think... We might not use that term, be ashamed, but we can understand that somebody who's put a lot of work into something and it hasn't produced would feel pretty bad about that, would not be proud of that work that they put in. Um, and so would that turn to grieving? It could. And, and so it's just, it's just sticky in terms of knowing for sure what's happening there. One of the things, the reason that I really actually are probably going to do more with, with Hebrew as we go is this and other things are a demonstration of how Hebrew poetry works, is that he, the authors love to use things like that as a way <laughs> to make it a more artfully put together thing. Let's take two words that actually both apply and have the same root or sound really similar, and then put them together so that it's kind of a both. Be, be ashamed and despair. Um, and, and then fits with the parallelism um, that follows. Wail, you vine growth. Grieve for the wheat and the barley because the harvest is destroyed. There's all the way through this particular section this interweaving of those roots in a way that just, if you know the language, it's beautiful, and if you don't, it's just confusing. And I apologize for that, but it just is. It's just a gorgeously put together um, section, really. Anyway, that's, that's a little bit distracting, but it's mostly just to make, clarify, if you're looking at a translation that differs, wh why is it so different? It seems so different. Here, here's where that, that kind of comes from. Um, okay, that was, a, that was 11. And then 13, we get to put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn, um, and, and cause them to wail before the altar, to spend the night even in sackcloth ministering before the Lord. Um, some of this is, as I mentioned, descriptive of, uh, it's a call, do this. Some of it is describing what's happening. Um, 
I'm going to start with the priests. The priests typically are not supposed to mourn loss. An example of this is found in Leviticus, one of everybody's favorite places to go. Leviticus chapter 21, verses 10 through 12. The high priest, the one among his brothers who has had the anointing oil poured on his head and who has been ordained to wear the priestly garments, must not let his hair become unkempt or tear his clothes. He must not enter a place where there is a dead body. He must not make himself unclean, even for his father or mother, nor leave the sanctuary of his God or desecrate it, because he has been dedicated by the anointing oil of his God. I am the Lord. That the nature of his function, not just his profession, but his function within the community as the one who brings the community's everything, their joy and their sadness, their sin and their sorrow to the Lord, is that he's forbidden to partake of certain elements of those things. And one of them is grief. That in order to continue bringing the sacrifices of, his, of the people to the Lord, he's, he's not supposed to essentially defile himself by doing the things that they did in their culture to display mourning. That's typically how that works. But here, God is telling the priests to do exactly that to take on all of the things associated in their culture and society with mourning, really on behalf of all the people. To enter into that process, to, to express the dire nature of the situation before the altar, in God's presence, to, to really bring the needs of the people into the presence of the Lord. That's how desperate the situation is, but it's also really important for this concept that we see of what it looks like to do that, to demonstrate what, what the situation means for God's people. An another example is, is really in verse 10, and again gets into the, all the, the language stuff more than I'd want it to, but in verse 10... Uh, NIV and, and New Living say the fields, uh, the ground is dried up. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up. Um, but every other English translation says the ground is mourning, which is really what the Hebrew says. And there's a, a good reason that's, that's long, but there's a good reason why the NIV and the NLT go with dried up. But... Um, really at the root of it, is this idea that the ground is mourning. That the ground itself, so that's an observation. Joel's not calling the ground to mourn. He's not commanding the ground to do that. He's recognizing that's what's happening. That's what they're seeing unfold before them, is that God's creation is reacting to the events that occurred by not doing what they typically would do. That it's a, it's a recre the creation itself is demonstrating its reaction to the signs of the curse. That how things should be versus how they are is seen even in how God's creation either does what he made it to do or doesn't do what he made it to do. So a contrast, a, a really vivid contrast comes from Isaiah 55, um, verse 12. It says, You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. Instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. That, that the fruitfulness of the creation is a sign of God's relationship with his people being good. And, and the lack of fruitfulness is a sign that, that the relationship itself has also dried up. There's, 
So there's just so many plays on words that I just can't, I can't pass it up, but I also can't just dwell on it. And I'm, I'm really sorry for wrestling with that in front of you, but it's, it's all so tied together, and it's meant to help us see that it's all so tied together. You know, we modernists go and say, well, the, the, the vine is empty because of the season or because of the, well, we had some change in the, the rainfall this year that accounts for the lack of, that's true, but why? Why was there that seasonal change? Why did we not get as much rain? There's certain things that we can parse, but we only get so far. The more we ask why, at some point we get to, well, we, we can't explain this element. And it always comes down to, well, this is how God worked to either provide or not provide in this manner. Um, and, and just to, to drive home a little bit of how that works in verse 10, so if you translate, the fields are ruined, the ground is in mourning, there's a Hebrew word that we don't have translated for whatever reason that means like because or for, the grain, so why is the ground mourning? Because the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, and the olive oil fails. That the, the ground itself is recognizing, like the farmer, it hasn't produced the, the fruit of its labors. And, and that's shameful. It's also just distressing. It's grievous. So it demonstrates grief. Next, we're going to go to seeking relief. Seeking relief. Verse 14 shows us where that response, the acknowledgement of loss, the demonstration of grief, should be directed. The, so I'll read that, and then I'll, and I'll explain a little. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Uh, and I'll just point out quickly that, that summon the elders and all who live in the land connects us back. It's kind of sandwiches here with verse 2. Hear this, you elders, listen to all who live in the land. It's a, again, one of those nice poetic things that we look at and say, wow, that's so wonderful how it's constructed. Anyway, um, the prophets have a lot to say about false demonstrations of grief. So there are places where God says, I don't want your fasts. I don't want all these things. I don't want your festivals and your feasts. I don't don't want that. Why? Well, because he's declaring their hearts aren't behind it. It's It's just a show. Here, Joel is not worried about the show. They're not, they're clearly not doing the show. Here, Joel is is calling them to do things that that they're missing because they're just not processing properly what's going on around them. The issue is not false piety in Joel. It's, it's failing, the need to seek relief from the proper source. And so it is, in this case, entirely appropriate that they would fast as a nation, that they would come together and bring this to God, because that's the only way they're going to find a solution. It's, it's not sufficient to just acknowledge the problem. It's not sufficient to just acknowledge the problem and then demonstrate the grief associated with that problem. So, you know, I can get together with my friends and, and, and even hearken back to, well, last week we said that the, the disaster shared. So we're going to sit together and we're going to share in the disaster and we're going to acknowledge the grief. We're going to name what's going on and, and then we're going to demonstrate. We're going to have this external emotional response. And now everything will be all right. I can try that, and it might make me feel a little better, but it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't make the crops produce fruit. It doesn't send rain. It doesn't, 
do the things needed to actually get us out of the situation. It's not the end. In order to find relief from the disaster, we have to seek it from the only source that can truly provide that relief. So we can list our problems and we can publicly display our emotions, but that only takes us so far. It only takes us as far as those who see and hear those acknowledgments and demonstrations have the ability to do something about it. So if your, if your problem is with, I don't know, a local authority, and you bring that problem to the local authority, and you, you list out the problems, and you explain how painful it is in your life, and they go, oh, well, we should fix that. We, we know how to fix that. We can change this thing. We can provide this thing, or we can change this law, or we can whatever, right? So you call your congressman and say, there's a pothole. We need it fixed. It's breaking people's cars. And he goes, well, how many cars? How old were those cars? Were they going to break anyway? No, no, the brand new cars are breaking because this hole is so terrible. Oh, okay. People are getting lost in the hole in the ground in the middle of the road. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I'll put that in the next budget bill and make sure that we get that taken care of. That, it works if you bring it to the person who can solve the problem. But if the problem is not solvable by the people you're expressing the, the nature of the problem to and showing all of your grief to, it, it, it might bring some solidarity, but it doesn't solve the problem. One of the most, I almost don't want to use this phrase because I know that it's so loaded on both sides today. Bear with me, please. I promise on the other side of this, everybody will come out okay. One of the most commendable things about our increasingly therapeutic culture, and I know some of you are already like raging because I used that phrase. One of the most commendable things about it is that it does help people with the first two parts of this process. So as a society for quite some time, we have, we have gotten away from both of those things. Just ignore the problem, don't, don't mention it, and shove all those deep feelings Eep down inside, don't express them, right? And so the therapeutic culture has kind of said, no, 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 we can't do that. That's really bad for us. We got to bring all that stuff out. You got to let it out. You got to talk to people about it. And you got to show people how you feel about it. And the, okay, but that's about as far as it takes us. It, it, it helps us with acknowledging loss, helps with demonstrating grief, but the biggest weakness is that it doesn't complete the process. It doesn't lead us to take all of that to seek the relief where it may actually be found. It might put us in touch with the reality of our plight and encourage us to express how we feel about that plight. It just, and those are good, it just doesn't, it doesn't fix it. The, the philosophy of our age, though, is that the solution to all of our problems is found within. And so if I get all that junk out, that, that gives me the ability to look more deeply inside myself and find within the real solution to my problem and the peace that I need in the midst of it. But, but Scripture... The gospel, the good news, is that, that God has actually already provided the solution to all of those problems through his son. That the solution's not in us, the solution's in him. Yet he, he sends his spirit to dwell in us, but that's never what we're talking about when we talk about you just need to find the solution in yourself. We're always talking about ourselves pulling ourselves up. 
But Scripture tells us over and over and over again that what God wants from his people is for us to look to him for the solutions. And whenever we look anywhere else for the solutions, we're, we're essentially elevating the, the else to the status of God. There's um, another prophet that, that I love, and maybe one day, I don't think anytime soon because it's so long, but maybe one day we'll get to it is Jeremiah. One of the recurring themes in the book of Jeremiah is that the the political leaders in Israel want to create and form an alliance with Egypt to protect themselves from the big bad guys to the east of them. And over and over again, Jeremiah says, you can't do that. Don't look to Egypt. They're not going to help. They can't help you. They won't be able to give you the peace and security that you need. You have to seek it where it may be found. Go to the Lord. He's the one who can actually protect you. And they just keep not listening, and that's the theme of the book as well. But this is another piece. This is, this is a similar kind of concept, that they they aren't supposed to just pull themselves together and find a way to share what meager things might be left, because we already heard there's nothing left. The locusts took everything. And they're not supposed to go to their neighbors and say, hey, we're in a bind. Is there anything that we can do to convince you to share some of your food with us? The solution is to bring all of their grief and demonstrate it before the Lord and say, this is horrible. God, why are we suffering like this? How long do we have to endure this? When are you going to help us live? We're dying here. God responds to those cries from his people. Over and over and over again, throughout scripture, throughout history, we, we see it played out again and again and again. That God wants his people to cry out to him and say, this is not bearable. And we don't have a solution. We need you to fix it. You're the only one who can do it. Please fix it. That's how the Israelites got out of slavery. Right? That's how the the book of Exodus begins. The cry went up to the Lord and he heard, oh man, that's, yeah, they're saying that's pretty terrible. We should probably do something about that. Hannah goes to the temple, can't even speak. She's just in tears before the Lord because she wants a son. And the Lord hears her prayer and provides. There's so many examples of God looking. He, Jesus gives, gives parables about widows who, who just keep going to the judge and saying, this isn't right, I need it fixed. And even the unrighteous judge says, I'm tired of hearing from this woman, so I'm going to fix her problem. So she'll go away. And says, this is how you're supposed to pray. But how many of us pray that way? Like we're nagging a judge. But that's what God calls his people to do, is to acknowledge our plight and then to bring it before him and and express fully how awful it is and how much we need his help. What do you do with your grief in the midst of a disaster, a calamity, when you're desperate? When you realize you can't fix it, how do you respond? Do you just try to ignore it? This is too much. I can't deal with it. I'm just going to push it over here and pretend it's not happening. Where do you go for solutions? How do you resolve it? 
Where do you seek relief? I'm sure that there's something that I could say or do that would wrap this up better. But I've been encouraged by some people in my life to be more open about different things happening. And, um, and I have with certain people. And I feel bad sharing in front of everybody all my stuff, so I don't share all my stuff. But as a demonstration, I suppose, of some of what we've looked at, of, of application, there's some things that only a few people in this room know about in my life that probably more should know about because I have been guarded. Um, just after Thanksgiving, my father, who will turn 70 in April, Lord willing, was diagnosed with stage 4 prostate cancer. It had spread to his spine. In December, he, he started radiation. Actually, the week after Christmas, started radiation. Um, in about a week, he starts chemo. Um, and I have not processed that. I have, I have enough other stuff in life. Some of you have read at one point in the local paper, we have an ongoing lawsuit with the school district over whether or not our seven-year-old can go to elementary school. My brother died just over a year ago. There's, there's more. Those are highlights, I suppose you could call them. Lowlights. It's hard. This isn't how it's supposed to be. People aren't supposed to die. We were, we were made to live forever in God's presence and joy and gladness. And we have hope that one day that'll be true. Thankfully, my dad is a believer, and so is my mom, and so they recognize that. But right now, neither of them wants to deal with the fact that they have to go to doctors all the time. They don't like doctors. Who likes doctors? Who wants to deal with medical billing and appointment schedules and reschedules and this and that and the rest of it? It's awful. Not to mention the actual health needs involved. I, I don't want my son to be excluded from things. I want him to be in part of a vibrant, thriving community. Who doesn't? Who wouldn't? That's not how things are supposed to be, but it's the way things are today, right now. And it's painful. It's sad. Sometimes it makes me angry. But you can't fix that. So I've acknowledged it. I'm not, hopefully, I'll make it through the next couple minutes. I'm, I'm not planning on crying and wailing and sitting in ashes. But I think you've gotten some demonstration of how I feel about those things. But you, you can't fix it. Who can fix it? God, God can fix it. He can fix all of those things. He can, that's right, yes, you can love me through it, but, but here's the thing. I have not brought those requests to the congregation. I have not invited you to pray. I have not invited you to join with us in, in bringing that before the Lord. And that's a problem. And so now I'm, here you go. We have those things. I'm not calling on you to make a prayer service for my family. I'm exemplifying that this is what it looks like for us to share our stuff with each other as God's people so that we can join together in bringing it to him. That, that we 
all cry out to him and say, God, this isn't how it's supposed to be. Why are people dying around us? Why are our kids not willing to sit down and have meals with us because of pain that they've endured over the years? And now they're adults and they're off on their own. Why, why is my life the way that it is? Why isn't it the way that you, want, you plan for it to be? When are you going to make it right? Why do these other people keep wronging me? When are you going to make that right? What, ve- the Lord says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Okay, so when are you going to dole that out? I'd love to see some of that. We're going to get to it in the book of Joel, don't worry. And when we get to it, we're all going to go, oh, not like that. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean it. I take it back because it's pretty harsh. But that's what God wants from his people. It's for us to, to, to go before him and let him know We agree with you. This is not how it's supposed to be. He says it's not how it's supposed to be. And he has already begun the process of making it right. Of overthrowing the enemy. The true enemy. The one who's the the cause of all of these things. And one day he'll come back and restore it all. God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you long to hear from us, that you want to hear from your people. Lord, we all have stuff in our lives that's really awful that we can't do anything about. Lord, help us to acknowledge just that, to begin with, that it's, it's beyond us, but it's there. Lord, give us the strength, the obedience to bring those things before you, to, to show you how that affects us. Lord, we cry out to you and long for you to make it all right. Come, Lord Jesus, come.